I hope you will take advantage of the fellowship time with the LTC crew and consider having lunch with them. Alan wanted me to mention that if you can't spend the time here, you can still purchase a lunch to go. So um, it's, a, it's a great project. The LTC program is, is very useful in helping our young people grow in their faith and in the practice of understanding scripture. So just thanks for those who have participated and have supported it over the few years that we've been doing it. Micah, my son, and I were making a run to Jack in the Box to get a sourdough jack. And as we pulled into the driveway of the restaurant, the suspension of my van expanded and the lower ball joint popped out of its socket. And so the van just fell down on the pavement and I was stuck, dead in the water, couldn't go anywhere. Got a tow truck, took my van to the house. I replaced that part, but I didn't want to replace all of them. I don't have that time, and it's hard on the back and all of that. So I took it to the repair shop. And I said, I think all of the ball joints need to be replaced. And the repairman said, okay, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it come back in a few days. So I came back to get it and he said, everything's fine. Have a good day. And Micah and I are making another, another run to the Jack in the Box for a sourdough Jack. And it happens again. And I go to the repair shop and I said, hey. And he says, yeah, we knew the ball joints were worn, but we didn't want to tell you about it. We didn't want to make you feel bad. And I thought, when the ball joint fell out, I could have been rolling down I-5, and that could have been a dangerous. So when it comes to truth, and life is at stake, I need to know that truth. I'm not afraid of it. I can handle the truth. A few years ago, I went to Dr. Chen. He's a heart doctor. I hear all the cool people in this church go to Dr. Chen. Is that cool? Is that, is that true? How many, how many go to Dr. Chen? Okay, yeah. see, that's, that's an amazing reality right there. The cool people go to Dr. Chen. And so I go there for a stress test. And I go through the stress test. Boy, that just wore me out, if you've ever done that stress test. And... And so I come back, and he says, everything's fine. You don't have to change anything. You can continue to eat whatever you want, go to Jack in the Box, get you a sourdough Jack. And, but let's just say later on, I had a stroke. And I go back to Dr. Chen, and I say, hey. And he said, yeah, I know that you have AFib, but I hate giving people news like that. I want them to feel loved and accepted when they come into my office. And of course, Dr. Chen wouldn't do that, and any good repair shop wouldn't do that, because the truth is useful in our lives. When life is at stake, we need to know the truth. We can handle the truth. And I'm thankful that Jesus wasn't like our fake stories of, of these services and people. Jesus always told us the truth. He told us the truth because he thought we could handle it. He created us. He made us. And he knows sometimes things are hard to hear. But he thinks we can handle the truth. In our passage, one of the, of the statements that Jesus makes that's kind of hard to accept is when he says that we must hate our own life. We must hate our own life. And that's a, that's, a hard, that's a hard statement to take. That's a hard truth to take. And it's not the same as 
I hate my life. You've heard your kids perhaps say that. And, and sometimes people have different struggles and they, they hate their lives. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about that self part of us that uh, is, is either damaged or dealing with stuff. And we have a tendency to put our self first in a lot of areas of life. Sometimes uh, people say that they hunger for the truth, but they seldom like it when it's served up. Jesus understands that, but he still wants us to understand the importance of truth in our lives. We need to hear the truth. We need to be able to put Jesus, and that's what he's talking about when he says, hate your life. He, he's talking about the idea of making him our priority and putting him first in our lives and putting him first in everything. So much to the point that our desires, our priorities, don't even come to a close second compared to the things that, that Jesus teaches us and the ways that he wants, to live, he wants us to live our lives. In our passage, the, the passage in Luke 14 follows on a, a progression that begins... Uh, perhaps in John chapter 9, but even, even before when Jesus begins to talk about his own death. And we know in other places where Jesus has mentioned that stuff, uh, Peter, for instance, says, no way, no way can that happen to you. But it's, it's part of the plan. It had to happen. As Jesus goes into Jerusalem at the end of Luke chapter 9, he is... He is he says, uh, the passage says that he resolutely set his face on going to Jerusalem. He was purposeful. He was determined. And as he goes into Jerusalem, if we fast forward to the end, people want to make him king. People think he's going to Jerusalem to rule. But why is he going to Jerusalem? To die. He's going to give up his life. And so that gives us a context of what's being talked about here in Luke 14, where he says, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. He's, he's, he's not talking about some of the things that we talk about sometimes when we say cross. Today, I think it would be accurate to say that people think that the cross means victory and hope. You think that's kind of a truism there? Not in Jesus' day. The cross meant death. And if you saw somebody with a cross, it wasn't on a chain around their neck. They were heading to a violent death. And so whatever Jesus says about the cross, it's not what we always think about. And he's, he's serious about it. In John chapter 10, verses 17, 18, in that section, he explains. He says, I'm going to lay down my life on my own accord. Sometimes we think about, uh, I've heard this before, maybe you have, uh, something's going on in my life, something's happened to me, and I say, well, that's the cross I have to bear. That's not what Jesus is talking about. It's not, what something, it's not something that somebody's doing to you, or a circumstance that has happened to you. It is something you take on for yourself to accomplish. It's, it's not something that somebody's forcing you to do. It's something that you do willingly. And that's a strong truth, but Jesus thinks we can handle it. And he wants us to be able to handle it because it brings benefit to life. The first thing it's going to do for us, it's going to save our life. In a similar passage in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, he's, um, then he said to them all, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, 
but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. On the screen text, I've underlined the word life. And though those words look the same, I don't think he means them in the same way. Life, the, whoever wants to save his life, that's talking about our, our, our kind of selfish self-life. The second life, but whoever loses his life, is kind of similar, but he's talking more like the, the spiritual life. There's the physical life and the spiritual life. And if we want to save our physical life, then we have to give up. I'm sorry, if we want to save our spiritual life, then we have to give up the physical life. And that's a hard truth to accept. But it benefits our lives in a lot of different ways. It benefits us from dealing with the mindsets and the misbeliefs that we collect throughout life. It helps us to, to deal with the difficult situations that we face that kind of keep us trapped in life. Our physical life is often burdened by many different things. Things because of our own actions, things because of stuff that people do to us. But as long as we are trying to preserve that life, as long as we are trying to hold on to that, we're going to lose. We're going to lose out. Sometimes people say, I hate my life. And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the challenges that they have in their physical life. They're talking about the difficulties. Maybe something has happened to them. Maybe they've made bad decisions and they're still dealing with the consequences in life. And even as we come to Christ, sometimes our, our consequences will come along with us. And it's, it's a burden. They can be a burden. But the message of, of the cross is that our lives have really been saved. And there's a value that is given to us as followers of Christ that no one else really understands. That value is communicated in this passage in Psalm chapter 139. And in this passage, we learn the immense value that people have in God's eyes because he has created us. He says, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I've been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All the days were written. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. The text on the screen, I have underlined two phrases in there. And they have to do with the physical life. And they have to do with the fact that if someone has this mindset, I hate my life, it's because they don't know. The passage says, I know this very well. A lot of people don't know that. They don't know who they are. They don't know that God has created them. They don't know that they have uniqueness and, and that God has a special, specific and intent for their lives. It says, all my days were written in your book and planned out before a single one of them began. Some people don't realize that. They think they're alone. They think they're by themselves. They think they have to deal with the circumstances of their life on their own. But this passage tells us, no, you don't have to hate your life. Because the one you are connected with not only has created you in a unique way, this person who created you is amazingly awesome. In this passage, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it says, for everything, and this is talking about the person that loves you, this is talking about the person who gave you life. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. This person that loves you, he has created everything. Dallas Willard said he's the smartest person in the world. 
not only one of the smart people who has ever lived, he is the smartest person in the world. And that's the one that's connected to your life. It says, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. And I should have underlined, <clears throat> by, all, by him, all things hold together. Because it reminds us that he can hold my life together. He can keep things together when everything seems to be flying apart. When the circumstances of life threaten to overwhelm me, he can hold things together. And therefore, I don't hate my life. I understand that I am of value and that when I understand that he has saved my life, that means I understand I have something to give and I have some things that perhaps I need to give up. Which leads to our second point is that he has simplified our lives. That's why he wants us to understand this amazing truth, to hate our own lives, because he wants our lives to be simplified. Our lives are often very complicated. Lots of things going on, lots of different parts, lots of concerns that we have that our physical life has. But think about your heart, your life, as kind of like a conference table. And at this conference table are seated many different people that represent who you are. Maybe it's your recreational self, your pleasure self, your career self, your hobby self, your chill time self. All of these people are at this conference table. And depending on what's going on in your life right now, one of those selves is the chairperson for the meeting of the day. But because we have these competing priorities, oftentimes nothing gets done. We debate, we discuss, we argue, we try to passionately get our point across. And the idea behind this is this is going on inside my life. I have competing priorities. But Jesus wants to simplify that in my life. He wants, to, he wants us to realize that this battle, as long as we let it go, is going to go on. James chapter 4. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? And that's what I think he, part of what he's talking about. All of these competing rivalries, priorities are at the table and, and each one wants its own way. You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You do not have because you don't ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on yourselves. This is really what's going on in our lives if we don't accept the simplification that Jesus brings. Now somebody might say, well, okay, I, I become a Christian. That means I, then I give Jesus a chair at the table. But that's not the idea. The idea is that there's really only one chair at this table. And it's a throne. And Jesus is on that throne. And that simplifies my life. If I take the other idea that, if I take the idea that, that uh, as I become a Christian, I'm just adding another chair, a religious chair to that table, then I still have the struggle going on. Jesus tells us you can't, you can't choose both God and money. You, you have to make a decision on who you're going to serve. You have to make a decision whether or not you're going to let God simplify your life. 
so that there's only one priority and one loyalty and one focus. When we're able to do that, Jesus is also able to salt your life. And like this statement, I've seen this quote in a different, couple of different places. Without purpose that is bigger than yourself, you are more likely to only serve yourself. You think that's true? I think it's true. I think it is demonstrated in a lot of different areas of our lives. And Jesus uses this concept then of salt to communicate purpose in our lives. We just don't become a Christian and then exist. We become a Christian, the idea is that we we become salt. And he closes this section off in Luke 14. What good is salt if it isn't salty? What's he talking about there? He's talking about the Christian life. What good is your life in Christ if it doesn't look like Christ? If you're not following him? If the influence of your life isn't positive and redeeming? We know that salt is is a very important ingredient in life. And even today, salt is pretty crucial. In Jesus' day, it was even more important. They used it for for preserving meats, they used it to, as we use it today, in cooking. It's been, it, it was used, uh, if you had a toothache, I don't think I want to try that one, but I've heard that one before, you put salt on it, it's good for bad breath. They used it for bad breath. So, if you're, if you're having some issues there, try it. It had a lot of uses. But if it wasn't salty, then the only thing it was useful for was to be thrown on the ground. If you wanted to kill plants on a, on a trail, you could kind of use it for that. And you might think that might even have a purpose. But beyond that, it's just, it's just trampled underfoot. It is of no real purpose. So Jesus is making a hard statement to followers of his about whether or not we are serving his purpose. If he's my priority, then I'm going to serve his purpose. And my life is going to be salty. When I think about a salty life, I think about some of our ancestors, brothers and sisters who have demonstrated just an unbelievable faithfulness by how they live their lives. And one believer in recent history is a minister named Joseph Tan. And he lived in Romania during the time of Nicolae Ceausescu. And he was a strong believer. He was a very popular believer. His radio program was known throughout his country. He wrote many books. And oftentimes, because he spoke so boldly about Christ, he would be arrested. And he would be persecuted. And one particular time, he was arrested, and the arresting officer said, I could kill you if I wanted to. And Joseph said, Your ultimate weapon is killing me. But my ultimate weapon is dying. If you want to kill me, you need to realize that it is going to just enhance my popularity. Because people who love my writings and love my programs are going to realize that I went all the way. I gave my life for what I believed. And so it's just like adding fuel to the fire of my ministry. 
So they let him go. He came to the United States for a period of time. And that gave him some time to think about his situation. And, and after this situation, he said, that gave me pause. For years, I was a Christian who was cautious because I wanted to survive. I had accepted all the restrictions of the, that the authorities placed on me because I wanted to live. Now I wanted to die, and they, they wouldn't oblige. Now... I could do whatever I wanted in Romania for Christ. For years, I wanted to save my life, and I was losing it. Now, I want to lose it, and I was winning it. Joseph Tan is a pretty salty fellow. And I think there's something in his life as an example to the rest of us about the seriousness of our commitment. What are we giving up to demonstrate our faith? And I want to end this morning with two, with two questions and a statement. Um, in the file that I sent to Ray, this is just kind of an editor's note, the, uh, see the, the can't? That was crossed out. So... It changed between my computer and Ray's computer. It said, you can't, can handle the truth. Anyway, so uh, just thought I'd point that out. First question. What will you willingly embrace, sacrifice, deny yourself for the sake of following Christ? As long as we hold on to stuff, we should be letting go. We're going to have conflicts in our lives. Oftentimes, the things we need to deny ourselves are things that are causing problems in our personal lives. They're causing problems in our marriage. Sometimes we can get pretty self-centered about what we think we're supposed to have and what we're supposed to do and what we should expect from this life. And Jesus is really giving a whole different picture to life. One of the keys to a successful marriage, to being a good parent, to being a good worker, is to realize that giving up of yourself, sacrificing something for the cause, is something that, that people take note of, and something that just brings out the best in the people around you. When you deny yourself things that you think you otherwise should be entitled to, a dynamic, a power, an animation will take place in your life that you would not believe. And that's when God gets to use us, is when he has complete control over our lives. Second question, which self, we're looking back at that conference table, which self has a little too much leverage right now and is coming in between you and Jesus? As a follower of Christ, we don't, we don't claim that, boom, I'm baptized and everything's perfect. As a matter of fact, it's kind of the opposite. Once we're baptized, that's when the real battle begins. And we have to constantly be looking at our lives and constantly evaluating what is kicking Jesus off the throne in my personal life. You've got to ask that question. And then the statement, always got to have us some Dietrich Bonhoeffer. To deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is, he leads the way. Keep close to him. And that's how I want to end our time together this morning. I want to challenge you to make that decision again 
today, tomorrow, the next day, if you're a follower of Christ, that you are going to keep close to him, that the reflection of your life looks exactly like Christ, or to the best of your ability, by his grace and by the power of his Holy Spirit. You have that in you as a follower of Christ. Bring it to bear on what's happening in your life. And this morning, if you need to take that first step in getting close to him, and and that's how I understand baptism to be. Once I come to the point of belief and I realize that I need to change my life, I take that step in faith and obedience and, and agree to do the same thing that Jesus did. To be immersed, to be clothed, to be changed. If you need to make that change this morning, submitting yourself to be baptized to the commands of Christ, would you do that now while we stand and sing?